Thank you, Rodney. Good. I was going to say good morning, but good afternoon. It's 12 now. I'm so excited to join today and present on what I consider my, my knowledge. Um, I will say that this is my experience with this work. So I think it's important that I say that up front so that you don't feel like everything I say is um, what I expect everyone to do. This is my lived experience. This is how I see diversity, equity, and inclusion playing out. And this is why I think that the work is important. Um, a little bit about myself. I joined the JMU team on September 1st. So I'm still relatively new to the JMU community. I'm still learning Harrisonburg and our campus community. I'm really excited to do my first presentation actually at the university with the Lifelong Learning Institute. So let me share my screen and we will get started. So I was talking with Rodney and Shanta about what would I talk about today? And we kind of went back and forth a little bit with conversation around topics and we settled on yes and why diversity, equity, and inclusion matter. So again, I'm Brent Lewis, Associate Vice President, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, James Madison University. I thought I would start with the elephant in the room. Why does this work matter? Why does DEI matter to folks? Um, this is kind of the framework that leads into the rest of the discussion. But essentially, Diversity, equity, and inclusion matters because it creates safe spaces for individuals to be authentically them. However that shows up and however that is, it creates that space to be free, to be me. Um, it affirms identities and people's lived experiences. It's important for us to reflect that every person that looks the same does not have the same experience. Every person that comes from similar backgrounds or identities will not navigate spaces the same way. So giving that, that freedom to people's lived experiences and to folks to share that, um, it creates a sense of belonging. When, when we think about this in the context of higher education and university settings, students are coming in looking for a space where they can feel they are at home, a home away from home. We can't create a sense of belonging or a sense of you, you can be here without creating a space that says diversity, equity, and inclusion matters. It provides a space to see diversity of thought and experiences. Everyone has different ways of thinking, ways of engagement, um, and we don't all look at it from the same lens. My lived experience is my lived experience, but that doesn't mean that that's yours. So rather than disagreeing, we can learn to listen to diverse perspectives through diversity mattering. It encourages free expression. I learned a lot of my free expression in college because I went into a space that affirmed my identity. It affirmed my voice. I didn't always feel like I had voice to share my perspective, to share if I had a difference of opinion. And lastly, it builds and enhances our communities. Um, I think we are more similar than we are different. And as long as we're divided, and not communicating, it creates that space where we can't build synergy. So if you have diversity, equity, and inclusion work ingrained in what we do, it builds and enhances a community. It builds relationships that are fruitful, that are engaging and lifelong. So as I think about embracing diversity, equity, and inclusion, I also think about the term change. DEI is a huge part of change and also a part of why it matters to us. Um, you know, when I came to JMU, I didn't know anything about Harrisonburg. I didn't know much about the campus, but I've always been a change agent and open to change. And so when I looked at this picture of the word change, it stood out to me because the C is interchangeable. And I believe that as we think about why diversity matters, it's taking a chance. It's taking a chance to be vulnerable. It's taking a chance to think differently, to be open to our ways of thinking, even if it doesn't align with parents' perspectives or the way we were raised. 
or what we learned growing up in church or in school or in your neighborhood. All of those things impact you. But as individuals, what are our values? What are How do we move through change and navigate it and embrace it as we understand how the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion matters? So, I, you know, I took a chance in, in coming here and, and learning this community, this campus community, um, because I'm open to change and I embrace it. Everyone doesn't, but I think it, it creates, an, again, a different synergy when you're willing to embrace change. So what does change look like? According to the dictionary, it's defined to be to become different, to undergo transformation or transition. Transition is not always comfortable, but it's the willingness to be uncomfortable, right? Um, change is an openness to a new approach, to new leadership, to new ways, um, new structures, and open to being uncomfortable. So I picked these pictures at the bottom really intentionally. I like the colors in the first one. Um, I like the message in the second one, time for change. It's hard to know when it's time, right? Sometimes you have to assess, what are we doing? Is it effective? Is it working? When, when do we make, need to make a shift in how we view things or how we do things? And I like the third picture that says, change your head. So it's warning you right, that there's going to be a shift or there's going to be a different way of looking at things. And then that last picture, old, old way with one arrow and new way with the other. It's not saying it's either or, but it's saying let's meet in the middle and figure out how we create these changes, how we create this space of, of welcoming and affirming together. So how do you do that? Well, there's a model that I like to use called the social change model in leadership. And this model is, a, is an approach that is purposeful. It's collaborative. We can't do any of this work individually. Diversity matters, but it can't matter to one person or one group. It has to be a collective experience. It's value-based and it's a process that has results that create positive change. In addition, the social change model through leadership is built on assumptions. So these assumptions look at leadership is a social responsibility that impacts everyone, change for everyone. It's collaborative, engaging. It's a process and not a position. Sometimes people see leaders in their position and not the process to, so, to leadership, right? And so I'm the associate vice president. That's just the position. But that's not the process to what I do. That's not the process to creating change. That's not the process to helping our campus embrace diversity, equity, and inclusion. So people see oftentimes the position and the person, but they don't see the backdrop, which is the process, which is the work, what's happening to create these spaces. Um, leadership is inclusive and accessible to all people through a social change lens. And leadership is values-based through a social justice and social change lens. This model has been proven to be effective in organizations looking to talk about why diversity matters and why it's important and how you go from talking to action items. That's where a lot of organizations sit right now. We're creating these models, we're creating um, frameworks, but then the work comes in and how do you move from the model and the framework to actionable items that are realistic in the space that you're in. So that brings the need to reframe leadership and a lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So you may ask, what does that look like? Well, according to Bowman and Deal, the ability of leaders to reframe sets um, and look at things that avoid the cognitive ruts. The cognitive ruts is in layman's terms, we've always done it this way, right? This has worked, it's always worked. There's not been a need to shift and change the way we do this. That's a cognitive rut. We've got to think critically. We've got to think strategically about how we reframe leaders and how we, we look at it from a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens. Um, leaders that look to reframe can expand how they think about using methods and models to, uh, to manage what's occurring through complex, complex situations in their organization. 
you look at this from a social justice mindset through innovation and adaptive leadership. Adaptive leadership meaning there's got to be some flexibility to how we do this. Um, there's not a one size fits all. There's not a there's a lot of gray in this work. So if you're a black and white mover and shaker, diversity, equity, and inclusion is going to be a challenge for you because every scenario, every situation that I have faced in the two months of being at JMU has looked different. Every concern that my three departments that uh, report to me looks different. Seamus has different needs versus SOGI, which is our uh, LGBTQ unit. Um, they have different needs from the Office of Disability Services. So I have to look at this and reframe how I respond, how we engage, and not look at it from a lens of a cognitive rut. So my philosophy of diversity, equity, and inclusion, I believe that we need to build cultures that is inclusive, affirming, equitable, and accessible for all. These are terms that if you're doing this work, you should be using. Uh, students that are from a diverse background, as well as faculty and staff who are from underrepresented communities or marginalized spaces, will be looking for this type of language, inclusivity, aff affirmation, equitable, accessibility. There's a lot of pieces to diversity that's visible, but also invisible. Many of our students with disabilities have invisible disabilities. So it's important to point out words like accessible. So students understand and conceptualize, we know you're here and we are here to process and create spaces that are safe for you. Um, I see diversity as acknowledging representation, the differences in, our, in the ways that we show up, but you can't stop there. That's just saying, we know you're here and we acknowledge the differences are here. But when you move to an equity space, you take that acknowledgement and say, okay, now we're looking at fair treatment. We're looking at equal opportunity, equal access. We're working to eliminate barriers that impact your experience. And we're also looking to understand the root issues and disparities that you face within this space. So we gotta look at it from a historical context. We cannot erase history. The history has happened. So in this moment, we acknowledge it and we move forward together in a positive way that's engaging of our communities. As we move to the term inclusion, then we talk about being inviting and diverse perspectives, giving voice to those that have often been historically silenced, giving space for difference in identities to be at the table and their voices to be heard and included, part of the community, they feel valued, and we acknowledge and include those spaces in everything we do. This work cannot happen in one space. And so I often talk to colleagues at colleges and universities and say, I think it's great that you have a diversity office, or I think it's great that you have a chief diversity officer, but how does that person, or how do those offices, or how do those roles intersect with the rest of the community? community around us, the community on our campuses? How do we partner? How do we engage? And what synergy is created out of that? Because that work, that collaboration, that partnership then creates and shifts and changes culture and climate. The climate is whatever the people on the, in the space want it to be and what it's been historically impacts the now. Strategic planning, I feel like, is a huge aspect of diversity and inclusion work and why it matters. Um, I believe the organizations should be infusing DEI initiatives into their policies and their overall strategic plans to execute social change within orgs. Um, I think resourcing is important, and you see where people's priorities are based on where they're, where they're willing to put money. What are we willing to fund? Um, resources should not be a barrier to this work. How does the vision and the mission of the organization align with diversity, equity, and inclusion? So look at the missions of organizations. Is there anything there about diversity, equity, and inclusion? Uh, are there diversity statements that are connected to the mission? What accountability measures are in place for this work? Who's responsible 
or follow up if there's failure to complete tasks that are associated with this work. It's not new. Many organizations are now doing DEI work, but I do struggle with the accountability piece to ask who's following up, who's holding multiple constituents and stakeholders accountable. And then are there any SWOT analysis happening with this work? Is, are we looking at the strengths? Are we looking at weaknesses of our organizations? Are we looking at areas of opportunity? And are we looking at threats? There are threats both, if you're talking about a higher ed lens and our landscape, there's threats on university campuses, but there's also a lot of threats in communities that are around organizations. An organization may have really good um, ideas, really good intent, but if the people around it are, have a totally different mindset or perspective, it does create challenge. That moves us to the next topic of intersectionality. As you look up and think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's important to know that identities don't move siloed. So if you identify as Hispanic and male and Catholic, you're all three of those things all the time. If you're low social economic status, um, a first gen college student, all of those identities, you're the same all the time. If you're an aging adult and from a low socioeconomic status, you're both of those all the time. You can't pull them apart. And so the way that you navigate spaces and the way that people engage you can sometimes depend on some of your, your identities that are sometimes discriminated against. And so it looks at social categories such as race, class, gender, sexuality, um, gender identity, social economic status, disadvantages, the ways those things overlap and intersect creates intersectionality. And so I think it's important that inclusive leaders consider the intersections of identities for people showing up in spaces. Um, some of our identities are visible and some of them are not. And the ways in which we internalize our identities looks different. So I ask you this question and I want you to take a moment and just think about it. Have you ever considered how the intersections of your identities have impacted your lived experiences? Just think about that for a second. Have you ever stopped to think about the ways in which you identify and how it has impacted you in your lifetime? Whether that's been privileges that you hold and ways that that has made for you or ways, or if that's things that are barriers or marginalized communities, how has that impacted you? So I'm gonna ask you to do a quick activity with me as you think about your identities. Don't put this in the chat. This is personal and just for you. Grab a piece of paper and a pen or your cell phone or your iPad, whatever you have. And I just want you to do this activity with me really quickly, just to kind of think about how often do we think about our identities and ways that they impact us? So I know some of you are still grabbing a pen or a piece of paper, so I'll give you a second to do that. For those of you that are ready, I'm gonna ask you the first question. Now, with this activity, you can only pick one identity that you align with. You can't pick multiple. So number one, the part of my identity that I am most aware of on a daily basis. You can only choose one. What, which part of your identity are you most aware of, you feel like, on a daily basis? Number two, the part of my identity that I am least aware of on a daily basis. This one you don't think about a lot, but you know you identify within this community. Number three, the part of my identity that was most emphasized or most important to my family The part of my identity that was most emphasized or most important 
to my family. That could be your parents, that could be your grandparents, whoever you grew up with. Number four, the part of my identity that provides me the most privilege. The part of my identity that provides me the most privilege is. Number five, the part of my identity that I believe is the most misunderstood is. And last, the identity that makes me feel discriminated is. Now I'm not going to ask you to share any of your responses to that question, but if you do to these questions, but if you do have access to the chat, which I don't know if you do because I can't see it because I'm screen sharing, but if you do have access to the chat, just share in the chat um, if this if this was easy or if this was difficult or if you've ever thought about it this way, um, if you've ever engaged in an activity like this, what did it make you think about? If you have access to the chat, just share those things with others, um, what, what it made you think about. Was it hard to compartmentalize and just choose one identity to focus on per question? You know, those types of things. Just feel free to drop those in the chat if you are willing to. As you get to know the diversity that exists, it's important to pay attention to language. Um, the language and terminology that you use is important and it has power and the terms that you use, make sure that it's not something derogatory or offensive to people. Um, that may vary based on people's level of comfort with certain terms. Get to know different cultures, listen and learn. Don't listen for the, the ability to respond to people, but really just listen, to lean in, engage, learn, educate yourself on others' experiences. Don't always lean into people and ask questions about their lived experience, but also take time to get some education. Jump on a podcast, watch the news, jump on a, um, a live stream. I think through COVID, we've all been doing more virtual types of activities like this, go to professional development, ask appropriate questions when it's deemed appropriate, um, build relationships with people. I think sometimes we get away from that, um, building relationships where we feel uncomfortable or where we don't know how to navigate it and build trust and rapport. The more trust and rapport that you build with people who look different from you and have a different culture, it helps people feel more comfortable with sharing about, this is how I feel when someone says this term, or this is how I feel when I feel like I've been stereotyped or people are making assumptions about a part of my identity. People are more open to sharing and engaging when you have built relationship. Equity within organizations. So promote equity and fair treatment, eliminate barriers and opportunity and access issues. Um, equal access to professional development. Take your own knowledge and take control of that. Address equity and pay. If you're in a leadership role within an organization, look across your staff members and what their, their pay looks like. Are people getting paid significantly different for doing the same job? Uh, level the playing field in all aspects for people. People, people acknowledge there being equity challenges within organizations and they want to feel that they are affirmed and they are welcomed and their identities don't impact them getting different treatment. We also have to be knowledgeable and cognizant that there are generational differences. I come from a millennial generation. Um, my parents are baby boomers and I think we look at things differently sometimes, but in often, cases we do agree on certain things. I think there's value in having conversations around how generations can look at diversity, equity, and inclusion, or even other topics in a different manner. Um, our current students, most of the undergraduates 
or Gen Z. And so sometimes I have to lean in, learn from them, engage with them, attend their programs because I'm a millennial and I'm on a different length, uh, different wavelength than them. We don't see things the same way, but that doesn't mean that I can't learn from them and they can't learn from me. Introducing DEI topics within organizations. Uh, I've done quite a bit of this during the pandemic, uh, just book clubs. When I was at Randolph College before I came here, we started a book club over the summer. I mean, the first book that we looked at was White Fragility. We broke up into small groups and just started having different conversations around the text. You could do something like this with your friends, with your families, to really ignite conversations around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Look at TV shows or movies. There's tons of stuff about diversity and inclusion on Netflix, Hulu, not sure who all uses some of those platforms, but there's tons of things that you can just research and watch documentaries about that will engage you in your own individualized learning. Utilize affinity groups. In my higher ed career, I have worked at universities where we've had affinity groups for faculty and staff, as well as these same type of groups for students. We've engaged with each other, we've had tough conversations, and it's been very impactful. Use inclusive hiring practices. If you are in a position where you are in a leadership role and you have the ability to hire people, make sure that you're following best practice around hiring and being inclusive in that process. Uh, look at your policies. If you're a, a working professional that works for an organization, are your policies inclusive? Do they think about people who are currently in the workforce? Um, are they intentional efforts within spaces to have these types of tough conversations, even outside of the workforce? How do we have these intentional hard conversations within our communities, in our churches, um, with our families, which are some of the hardest spaces to have real tough discussions about uncomfortable conversations? The last thing I'll share here is approaching this from a universal design. I've talked about a little bit in the beginning that it should not be just on one person to do this work. The universal design means it becomes part of everyone's work. Everyone thinks about diverse backgrounds, diverse communities, um, marginalized voices. Everyone in the process thinks about everyone. Which brings us to the next topic. How has recent events, um, current events impacted this work? We've seen quite a bit in the last few years on police brutality. So there's a strained relationship between marginalized communities and the police. Um, we saw this summer, the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Aubrey. We saw protests all the while that the pandemic is happening. Um, there's been challenges over the last few years with LGBTQ rights, uh, marriage equality was something that was uh, implemented a few years ago. There's a presidential election that's wrapping up. Um, we've been in virtual learning and virtual working environments for the last few months. And unemployment is at an all-time high. All of these pieces impact why diversity, equity, and inclusion matters. Um, I think we've seen a lot of the Black Lives Matter movement this summer around the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Aubrey. We have to have intentional conversations about these topics because it impacts our communities, it impacts students if you work in higher education, and they want to have these conversations. We can't shy away from what's uncomfortable, what's difficult, and, and particularly when it's political. It, it becomes really hard to navigate, even for people like me. I've worked in higher education for a long time, but I'm also a human. I'm still a person. So I have to also navigate my own personal experiences and personal feelings as I engage with everyone else. So as leaders, I think it's important that we have discussions with everybody. Check the temperature. How are people feeling? Are people open to these conversations? Are people nervous that they'll offend? Where are we? What's the temperature? Diversify the voices at the table. Get diverse perspectives. 
allow people to share their experiences and their lived experiences in the work, value the diversity and build genuine relationships. Be aware of the resources, the policies and the protocols that are in place to address individual need. And I love the word intentional and I love the word strategic. I think as we think about this work, it has to be intentional and it has to be strategic and it can't be for show. Um, it has to be theory to practice. So what we're saying we'll do and what we actually do, those two things should align. Best practices in this work, a climate study to understand what is the culture? How do people engage in this space? How are people treated and how does that show up? Uh, using inclusive language, which we've talked about, um, acknowledge privilege. That can also be a difficult task for people to say, I have privilege. Um, even for people in marginalized communities, there are some instances where we have privilege and we have to acknowledge those things. Offer visible and supportive presence, develop and implement inclusive policy, increase awareness of concerns or issues, and respond appropriately to anti-inclusive behavior. Safe spaces and allies, be supportive and affirming to everyone. Listen without judgment, provide safe spaces where individuals can share their concerns and experiences and appropriately refer people to community resources or programs or services that you know of that are effective and helpful and genuine. You should be aware of Title IX and First Amendment rights. Um, Title IX looks at discrimination or harassment due to identities. And then the First Amendment protects free speech and expression. An exemption to this is pretty hard to prove. And at this point, I am at the space for questions and dialogue. Thank you for joining. Hey. Uh Thank you, Brent. Uh, we do have a few questions that were sent privately. I'm going to cancel your spotlight so that we're back in gallery view. You can see the folks who have their video on. Uh, I'm going to begin with the questions that I've received and I will pose those. There are just two of them. Uh, but, but then afterwards, we're going to open it up. You talk about having a, a space to have this dialogue, to have these conversations. And I think an important part of that is granting people permission to speak. Right now, we have your microphones muted. We are going to extend that back to you. So if you would like um, to be unmuted, we do have 78 people, a lot of people to speak at once. Just drop a note in the chat window, I'd like to speak, and uh, we will extend that microphone access to you. Uh, you can also use the virtual hand feature. Uh, but, but Dr. Lewis, the first question is uh, talking about, let me, let me see, this is a question about gender. It says, how can we ensure that the oversights or mistakes that we make do not undermine our campaign or, or efforts of DEI? And then there's another part, how can we make active shifts to mediate harm that we have caused? For example, when a DEI leader constantly misgenders a student, it might communicate that the DEI system they uh, work with devalues gender identity. What shifts might need to be made here other than just fixing pronoun use? I hope you have all that. It's a lot to unpack. That is a lot to unpack. But the, the biggest thing I would say is making sure that those of us that are doing DEI work um, actually know what we're doing. Like we're, we're actually being educated and we're, we're having conversations with each other about what are you doing? What's working in your area? What kind of experiences are you having with students? Has a student told you that you use wrong, the wrong pronouns or you misgendered them? Sometimes there will be mistakes in this work and that is the reality. Uh, there's no perfection. We're not striving per for perfection. We're striving for understanding and engaging people across however they identify. And you learn from those mistakes. I've made mistakes with students. I corrected it, I apologized, and I use that as a learning experience with the next student. And then I use that as a talking tool with my colleagues to, to say, have you had some type of this, this type of challenge? Or has a student ever called you on this? What have you done to correct it? 
I hope that answer, answers the question. And uh, Brent, uh, there's an, another question. Actually, I, I've included here. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, I often talk with lifelong learners, many of whom are on the call. Uh, if you look at your video feed, you'll see some of our adult learners who are part of our community, uh, both broadly beyond JMU, but also part of our campus community. Uh, they are students uh, within professional and continuing education. Uh, but I've had opportunity for many people to come into my office when before COVID, and they were interested in serving as allies or advocates for social change. And often the question, whether it was posed to me directly or kind of not explicitly stated was, as a new resident, how do I get connected and become involved? Uh, someone who's not from a community suddenly finds themselves in Harrisonburg, and I post this to you because you yourself have recently relocated, are a new member of the community. What advice do you have uh, to our new residents? I don't know because I need some advice myself. <laughs> but I, I would say engage, get to know the area. That's what I've been doing my own self is trying to meet people on campus through platforms like this because obviously some people are not comfortable even in masks getting together and engaging. Um, I think about doing research and learning about organizations within the space where we work. Um, I know when I worked in Lynchburg, Virginia at Randolph, I got involved with a social justice organization within the town. Uh, we'd done programming that was social justice focused, um, my, but my supervisor introduced me to that. So I think it's also you have to find someone who understands you and, and your perspectives and your identities that then knows where to connect you. Uh, to those resources because I, you know, as a new person, you don't necessarily know where to go to engage in what you're passionate about. There's another question uh, that I can answer. Someone asked, will this presentation be available uh, afterwards for later viewing if you miss part of the, fir uh, the first portion or any portion? And the answer is yes, it will be available at our website, uh, www.jmu.edu slash LLI. I will drop that into the chat window before uh, we disconnect. Um, there's a comment here that says, I found success finding clubs, organizations off campus and getting involved with community service projects. Uh, and I think that's Casey. Thank you for that uh, adding to uh, resources that, that, that others might look at or ways to get connected. And just wait, we, we, I'm monitoring this window. Well, at this point, Brent, let's uh, extend microphone access. It gets a little loose uh, <laughs> when everybody speaks at once. So uh, friends just uh, please pay attention and have your microphones muted uh, when you're not contributing. Once you contribute, please mute again. Uh, it, it's worked in the past, uh, so I'm going to extend microphone access to everyone and anyone who would like to communicate with Dr. Lewis directly. That should be active now. And we invite questions, comments, uh, responses to anything that you heard during the presentation. Sure, I have a question if you don't mind. Yes, go ahead. Hi, Brent, it's so good to see you. We were colleagues at Randolph, so I, I'm so excited to be here today. Um, but Brent, do you have any suggestions uh, for organizations that say, well, that that's just how things have been done here? I feel like I've heard that numerous times and it's so frustrating. Hi, Casey. Casey was one of the people that helped me get very plugged into the Lynchburg and Randolph community. Casey, I hear that same um, comment, you know, we've always done it this way. I often ask colleagues, especially in higher education, have you ever done any assessment on that? Have you ever looked at the experiences and what the data shows about how effective what we're doing is? 
that kind of trips people up sometimes because in many cases we have not done any assessment. We have not done any type of climate study uh, to learn about people's lived experiences. We've not done focus groups to learn about diverse perspectives and we haven't invited diverse perspectives to the table where decision-making happens. So I, I often just challenge that and, and push back a little bit and say, how have we learned that this works? You know, that the way we've always done it is effective. Um, have we talked with students? Have we talked with campus partners? Have we talked with the communities, you know, around us? What do our constituents feel about this? Um, we've got to involve more people. And, and I think when you reach that net out and involve more people, the narrative will shift. The story will change about how we've always done things. And sometimes it becomes how we've always done things can be problematic. Thank you so much. You're the best. Miss you. Miss you too. I see, uh, Joe, you have your microphone unmuted. Do you have a question? Yes, uh, Dr. Lewis, uh, we're about to start a program at church uh, called Sacred Ground uh, that looks at, at racism a bit. And I'm wondering if there are some survey instruments out there that could be given to the congregation to get some sense of where they are uh, so that we don't start at a place that totally overwhelms people. Joe, I think you, you sit down and create some questions to, or survey questions to give your congregation. It's kind of based on knowing who your, who your members are and, and gauge it that way to really see where people are. You may even find it more effective to do a focus group um, with different members in different groups to understand where the level of understanding is for your church. And then you kind of get some baseline data on where should we start these conversations? Because the reality is some people are gonna be up here. Some people are gonna kind of be in the middle there with their level of comfort or level of understanding. And some people are gonna kind of be at the very cusp of having these conversations. And all of that is okay. It, Everybody doesn't need to be at an advanced level in these conversations. It just gives you some framework about where do we start? How do we meet people where they are and have this in conversation intentionally? Thank you. You're welcome. Good questions, really good questions. And uh, we, we have another you know, I, I love when people bring and share their knowledge with others too. And there's a comment in the chat window mentioning the uh, IDI. Uh, Dr. Lucy, you're probably familiar with this. I've completed it. I think it's very helpful, but that's the intercultural development inventory. And it, and it shows where people are uh, with regard to uh, your orientation to other cultures um, and, and how you're likely to interact and what's motivating those actions. So uh, I found that very helpful. Uh, that's a, another resource there in the chat window. Others who would like to speak, just go ahead and unmute yourself. I'd like to uh, ask something that might be a little controversial. Uh, I taught at JNU for 30 years. And every time I went to D Hall, the dining room, I would see all the black students sitting together, all the Asian students sitting together and the white students sitting together. Whenever I would pose that to a student, they would always say, those are the people I feel most comfortable with. And uh, this last year I had occasion to go to the D Hall a few times and I saw the same self segregation. And I really would like to have your comment on, is that something we could do something about? Is that something we should do something about? Well, that's not uncommon. And it's, it's, it's where people feel most safe in terms of, you know, who they sit with, the dying facilities, who you see people go to athletic events with. I do think if cultures become more inclusive, that you would see that shift some. Um, I know when I worked at Randolph, we did have those groups. Like when you, me and Casey went to the dining hall almost every day. 
And you did have those groups where you saw the athletes sitting together and you saw black students sitting together. But I think in that space, it's probably one of the first places that in higher ed I've worked where it was very mixed groups that hung out together, that ate lunch together. And I think some of that was just the nature of the campus climate and culture. And so I think if there's shifts in the way that we engage overall at the university, it does trickle down into the ways in which the students engage. Um, even as colleagues, I didn't just sit at the table with all black colleagues. So it gave um, a model for students to see even us coming into the dining hall or going to athletic events together that we were able to build friendships, um, true genuine relationships, even across our differences. Um, but I think it's gonna continue even in doing this work because people will gravitate to where they feel safe, who they feel like understands their experience. Um, I think that's part of the, the process. There's another question that I receive. I receive some of these privately, so you might not be seeing them. Uh, but a direct message is, uh, what is the metric that we use to de determine if larger society is equitable or inclusive? How do we know uh, that we're making progress in those regards, uh, Brent? I don't know that there's a metric where, where we'll just know that there's an equitable uh, threshold or, or, or point for society. Um, I can say that coming from a, a number of marginalized communities myself, I have seen improvements in certain spaces that I'm in, but in certain places that I'm in, depending on which identity I feel like is being more pinpointed, that's not always the case. And so I don't know that we will ever get to a place where everything's equitable, every space is affirming or inclusive for people, and, and people won't just feel like, based on who they are, their identity is, is having an impact that could be negative on them. So I, I don't know that we'll ever get to that place. But I do see, I do, I do know you can see improvement in certain spaces. Like if a campus organization has made improvements over the years, you can see that. You know, if you do a campus climate survey with students this year, and we fast forward and do one in 2025, and we've actively done the work, we should see some different results in 2025. The students shouldn't be saying five years from now, if we're actively doing the work, that there's no safe spaces for black students or there's no representation. Now, if we're not doing the work and we're staying in the same place, the results will show the same thing. monitoring many things. I think we're up to date with the questions. There is a comment. I think it builds upon uh, what you had said about affirmation. And when we were talking about groups, it seems to be uh, continuing on Esther's question of, of people tending to gravitate to where there's a sense of belonging and affirmation where they feel accepted, welcome, safe. Uh, I mentioned that only because I know some people Zoom may be new to you and you might not be seeing that running dialogue, but it's part of the conversation. So I repeat it so that you have access to the full discussion. But if others have questions or comments, uh, again, feel free to mute, unmute your microphone and speak. I have a question. Um, I consider this a very heavy duty thing that you hear mentioned often that Sunday morning is the most segregated time in our culture, that in our churches, we do not have an intersection of the whites and the, and the people of color. And I'm just, it's, it's just a puzzle to me how <clears throat> I haven't seen, or seen anybody to come up with some ideas to say, how can we change this? Um, what, what things can uh, some leadership, somebody like you can recommend just a couple of things of how, how we can intersect with one another in, in the church place? I agree with you. I grew up um, going to church, um, Disciples of Christ, my mom's Baptist, 
So I, I got to go to, you know, everything related to church. And as a child, I noticed very early on that everyone looked like me. Um, and even as an adult, I think people have just gravitated naturally to where they feel spiritual connection, where they see people who they feel understand that connection and that experience. Uh, I have gone to churches that have that are more multiracial. Uh, I believe that the church that many people that attend uh, here in, in Harrisonburg, a lot of JMU um, individuals go to a very multiracial church in this community. I think it's changing. I think it's shifting. I don't think it will happen quickly, but I do think in some communities, depending on where you are, where you're, what state you're in, what, does, what is the demographic of your community, I think some of that drives the, the, the segregation or, or the disconnects of Black, white, Hispanic, you know, whoever being at, at their own individual churches. Um, yep, Celeste, that was, the, that was the church I was mentioning. Um, Divine Unity Community Church. It's very diverse. Um, and you see a little bit of everybody in that space. So I think some churches are, are trying it out and, and having lots of success. And I think others are, are kind of traditional and, and what works for them works for them. And so Sunday morning we get up and we're still separated. I, I honestly think it's level of comfort um, for many people. And Celeste, thank you for that recommendation or that suggestion that now that so many congregations are, are, are convening online, uh, that maybe the technology allows people to feel more comfortable and to join uh, other uh, gatherings to see what's right for you. And, and so I really like that. I'd never thought about technology as as sort of enabling that sort of connection in that environment, but, but what a great insight you have there. Other questions, comments, um, responses, maybe to the something that was said or the activity that you were asked to do earlier, feel free to just join in while it's silent. I trust that all my answers are, are again, based on my lived experiences with this work. It doesn't mean it's the end all be all. There's, there's a, a number of ways to do this and engage in this work. Uh, hi, Brent and Rodney. Um, I'm Dave, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to articulate uh, this question. It needs a little background first. Um, the little exercise you gave us surprised me because uh, my fundamental identity has nothing to do with race. Uh, in three of the questions that you asked, my fundamental identity is educated. And when I look back at my life, um, um, I, I mean, I, everything that I value almost has come from the education I've received in my life, including a lot of people that I I am dear friends with, um, and I'm an academic, so I'm an educator. The problem is one way to look at the divide in this country is part, one partial way to look at it is between uneducated and educated. And I'm beginning to realize that we, educators and educated people who can think critically, can understand nuance, uh, can also come across as judgmental to those who are not uneducated. And particularly in this polarized political environment, that's very concerning to me. I mean, the, how does how do we begin to bridge that divide? 
Well, and, and thank you, Dave, for your comment. In doing this activity actually with myself, I had to acknowledge that education for me was part of my privileges. Uh, you know, coming from a space where I, I have, it's easier for me to go down the list of things that I'm marginalized in it's harder for me to find the privileges, but I'm educated. So I, I do have that privilege and I have used my education in spaces with some of my family or friends that I know are not either as educated as me or may not have even gone to college. So these types of conversations that we're having today, though this is my full-time job at JMU, I also do this in the community. I also do this with my family. Like I sit down and say, let's have this conversation. Yes, I know you don't want to. Yes, I know it's difficult, but we need to. Um, I've done it with my church. I've talked about LGBTQ issues with my church. Very uncomfortable conversation. But there, I know a lot of the members of my home church are not as educated as me on certain topics. And so it takes us and our willingness to go into spaces and have conversations, regardless of level of education, regardless of race, regardless of socioeconomic status, and put everybody on a level playing field and just have uncomfortable conversations about how do we feel? What does this look like? How does it make us feel? How do our identities drive the way we, we see things? Um, I think, Dave, that's the, the easiest and also hardest way that I've done it is just putting myself in spaces where I do own my educational privilege, but also use my knowledge to make change, positive change. I have a question. This is Janet. Hi, Janet. Hi. Um, going along with what Dave was just asked in your response, I, I see it more as there are people who are thinkers who look at a situation and think about it, and then there are the followers. And followers tend not to want to think about things. They just let someone else do it and then they go along with it. How do you bridge that kind of gap? Well, Janet, I think we see that in you know most organizations. There are folks who will take the lead and there are folks who will follow, even if it means it's not title driven. Like I've seen, in, in, within our organization, I've seen assistant directors take the lead on certain conversations and not a director. So I don't think it's position. I think it's um, ability. I think it's comfort. I think it's level of understanding, which is important in this conversation because you could be the most educated person degree-wise, but have little to no understanding of ways you should you could affirm people's identities or ways of looking at diversity. So I think it I think it's it looks different in different ways, but really honing in on people's strengths. You know, if someone is strong in leading an area or a conversation, let's let's utilize that strength. And and some people are meant to follow the lead or help those that are following see the vision and, and help them lead the way. I think it depends on you know engagement opportunities, what type of organization this is or if it's just community engagement. Um, I think the relationship building and engaging and people feeling comfortable will help that happen. Okay. Thank you. I feel like I'm at my dissertation defense again, <laughs> but it's fun, I'm enjoying. And Bren, I, I do want to, to um, silence is okay too. You know, people a lot to think about, a lot to unpack. So again, I just um, going to be quiet. We have time. And if you'd like to say anything, just unmute your microphone. And if you're sending private messages, I do know I'm getting those and I'm directing them where they need to go on your behalf. Just know I've really enjoyed spending this afternoon with each of you. Um, this is work that I'm passionate about. I, I enjoy it. I enjoy these types of conversations. 
Um, it drives my, my ability to do this, um, having these types of conversations with people. I don't shy away from it at all. Um, so feel free, if you're a community member or a campus member, to engage with me, utilize me. We can bounce things off of each other. Again, I'm not, we're not striving for perfection. We're striving for understanding each other and the, the need for the work. I have a Hi, Brent. This, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, <laughs> Melissa. I'll wait. I just, okay, I just want to say thank you, Brent. And I, you know, I'm still, as, as uh, Rodney just said, I'm still unpacking a lot. There's so much um, in this. And there's, um, I'd love to have your, your slides. I'm hoping that um, Rodney can make those available to everyone. I imagine others would really like to see those. You know, we're, we're really taking a look at, who we are, you know, in our unit at, at professional and continuing education. And one of the one of the um, questions I had for you is, I loved um, the exercise with uh, the intersectionality. That was powerful. And if we were to do something like that with our team members, um, how would you suggest facilitating that after doing something individually? Is that something you would would suggest then we sit around in small groups and talk about, or is it really just a personal reflection? I'd love to to share that with our team. How would you suggest facilitating that? Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. So in person, I actually do this activity much differently in person. Um, normally, I would um, set up identities around the room and have you kind of move about to a space like I would put religion on the wall. And so if I read a statement, if religion aligned to that statement, that group of people would go to that, to that sign on the wall. And then that is where we unpack and share. I went to religion for this reason, or I went to race for this reason, or I went to the wall that said gender for this reason. And it helps as a team, you understand people's lens, their views and how those views, perspectives, and values, their core values align with their workplace perspective. But you can do it a number of ways and do some back, you know, some backdrop before you do it and then have some small group conversations. I think it's more effective in small groups um, where people feel comfortable and safe and they feel like they can share. And you learn about your team members in a different way. And you understand like some of their thought process. Um, Rodney, there's a question in the chat. I can actually share with you the PowerPoint and also the intersectionality questions if you want to share it out. Thanks. We will do that. Um, you know, Shanta Sellers, uh, she's not only our Director of Marketing and Communications and Professional and Continuing Education, she's joining us. Uh, she will update the website with the link to the PowerPoint slides and the video if you send those along. But she's also our director of DEI within PC. And Shanta, I want to take an opportunity to thank you for introducing me to Dr. Lewis and making today's presentation possible, uh, that, that you identified an opportunity to speak to the broader community. And I, all of you won't know everyone on this call, but we know many of you and, and we see your registration. It is a more diverse group that you brought together here today than we usually have. We have adult learners, we have JMU students, we have JMU faculty, people from other institutions, uh, people who work in local government and scheduled facilities on behalf of lifelong learning. And we just appreciate you all being here, being part of this conversation. And uh, I wanna pause before bringing us to a close. That sounds like it's ending it, but I do wanna give everyone who wishes to a chance to speak. So if you have a question, comment, reflection you would like to share, I'm just going to pause briefly um, and then I'll close it up here. Uh, we end at 115. Brent, this is Carol from Professional and Continuing Education. I found the exercise difficult, but I found it difficult because I could not identify an identity to answer your question with. So specifically questions um, three and five, I, I couldn't come up with an identity. So what do I do? 
Carol, I say dig deeper. Take, take time to reflect on experiences in your life, whether it's been work experiences, higher ed and going to college, growing up. Just think deeper about all of your experiences with individuals and write out a list of your identities. That may be the start. Just sit down and write out all of the ways in which you have identified and then go back to the question. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. One second, I see that we have someone talking who needs to be unmuted. Just one second. Okay, this, I wanted to start out with a compliment for you, Rodney, because one of the stereotypes of getting old is that we lose IQ points, that we're not intellectually active. And I really think that LLI does a magnificent job of counteracting that stereotype. And I thank you, Rodney. Esther, thank you. And you know, I look forward to uh, continuing our conversation with Dr. Lewis. Uh, we had an opportunity to connect last week and I shared about our, our adult learning community and how you all are an important part of our community and important part of our campus and how we wish to reach more people. So I put our website into uh, the chat window. I will remind you if you're not seeing that, that is www.jmu.edu slash LLI. Uh, we welcome new members. All of you are welcome to join us next week when we return to this uh, free public education format. We will be joined by Dr. Jacqueline Walker, who will speaking, uh, her uh, topic will be rebirth of a nation reconstruction after the Civil War. And uh, she's going to look at some of the lingering effects of those decisions and how they manifest in society today. So certainly that will build on today's conversation. Uh, but I do want to thank uh, Dr. Lewis just for your time, your leadership. And you had mentioned that this was your first conversation, your first public presentation uh, here at JMU. I reminded you before I got disconnected that it was going to be great. Uh, you have a great presence, a warm personality. Uh, and I'm glad that someone like you is leading this conversation on campus. And because of you seem welcoming and inviting other people to feel comfortable to participate. I hope this is first conversation continues. And it's the, not the last time I know that you and I will talk, but everyone connected here and our lifelong learning community we look forward to bringing you back uh, to this conversation in the future. Until then, everyone be safe, be well, take care. We hope to see you next week.